Hello, my friends. It is Uncle Mike, and today is Wednesday, April the 21st, as they define it on the calendar system. But the truth of the matter is, it's just now. And I got a good one today. I'm super excited for this conversation. I mean, maybe it's not a conversation. Conversation should go both ways, but <laughs> I like to think of it as a conversation. So, okay, so um, where to begin? The first thing I want to do is say thank you. Thank you to all the people who have been joining me on the subscribe star page. The second half of this video is going to be just for the subscribe star folks. I recommend anyone who wants to see it, come and join us there. And I got a really good one today. I'm gonna to be going a little bit deeper into my own personal practice. So, you know, if you find that interesting or if you're curious what that is, you know, we're gonna be able to uh, see what that looks like. Um, also, uh, let's begin, let's begin today. Okay, 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 let's begin this way. So it is beautiful springtime right now. And yesterday in front of my house, like all the flowers were in bloom and they were spectacular. So I went and I cut some out and I have them on my desk. Uh, the big ones, the tulips, you know, they're, they're striking uh, visually, they're beautiful, but they don't really have much of an aroma. But these little guys right here, these purple ones, these purple and gold, they smell so good. They smell so good. There's something really, really uh, <laughs> nice when we smell um, when we smell flowers. Not just flowers, just like you know the aroma of of the the world which we live in. So this morning, this morning, uh, as I was preparing to do my morning meditation when I kind of prepare myself for the day. I, uh, um, I walked over to the, the cushion I like to sit on and I saw there was a bee on it. I saw there was a bee on it, and I, to me, that's a that's that's a good sign. That's a good indication, or at least it's something for me to, to to contemplate, to observe, you know, to tell a story on, and uh, it has a positive connotation. In fact, it brings back a memory. Back in 2011, I did a a two-week stay in the jungles of Peru and outside of Pacopa, for those of you who are familiar. And I was in an ayahuasca retreat. And the Cordero, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, you know, for a dude who likes to talk as much as me, I really struggle with a lot of words, like pronouncing them correctly. Uh, but anyway, you know, the person who does the poor, who leads the ayahuasca ceremony, she also, she was also uh, providing massage. She was providing a massage uh, the day after the ceremony. And I, I received a massage from her. And she was this tiny little Shipibo woman. And her primary language was, um, was you know, I don't know what, what the language is, which the Shipibo people speak, but that was her primary language. My primary language is English. And we both spoke a little bit of Spanish, and that was like our middle ground, and you know. But we were able to communicate. We were able to communicate in, um, you know, in a way which was deeper than that. So anyway, so so the massage takes place in this uh, in this kind of like a cabin, this beautiful cabin that was built in the jungle. It wasn't a tent. It was something that was more permanent. And so I'm lying on the table. And uh, she points up to the ceiling and she's showing me, and this is just like when it's beginning, and she's showing me like flying around or up in the, the ceiling. It was kind of like a, a, like a pointed, a cathedral ceiling. It, was, um, it wasn't flat, that there were all of these jungle wasps, like, you know, big wasps, like two inches, three inches. And she's pointing up to it and she's like, you know, <laughs> kind of seeing how I would respond. And, you know, jungle wasps are a little bit intimidating, particularly if you are in, a, uh, in an enclosed space and even more so being in a vulnerable position, you know, when you're 
lying down you're you the the it's as much of an art to receive massage as it is to give massage and you know i might not be a uh a talented uh, massage giver, but I think I am a talented massage receiver. And what that means is I'm able to like really relax my body and, and allow like even if it's physically uncomfortable to to surrender into into the massage therapy. So that's a vulnerable position. You have to relax completely. It's vulnerable just naturally um, to to if your body's giving you physical sensations like wow this this is uncomfortable this hurts if you've ever had rolfing or anything like that you you know you know what I'm talking about and so the idea of being in the jungle and getting the massage and having to relax to begin with and then having the 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 jungle wasps on on top of the whole thing you know it just added to the experience and added, you know, I'll use the word test, you know, that was just my way of, of looking at a lot of that experience, you know, this was a, a test, you know, a test to whom, maybe just myself, you know, what am I, how far am I capable of going? So I'm like, this is just, you know, part of it. It's like, you know, can I surrender into the experience? And, uh, you know, I did whatever I did. And she's, like, giving me the massage. I remember that she was, like, using her elbow and, like, really going into, like, your butt, like, your butt muscles where it's really tender. At least it is for me. And you want to you wanna tighten up and recoil from that. And that on top of the... the uh, um, the, the psychological implication of having these wasps on top of you uh, just added to the experience. And, you know, that's really what my memory is of that, of that particular time in Peru was meeting that challenge. So when I saw the, when I saw the bee on the meditation cushion, like I'm immediately brought back to that period of time, to that experience. And to me, that's a very positive, that's a very positive experience. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. That's a good sign because I knew I was going to do this recording today and I'm very excited about this. And uh, even more so than, than, um, than, you know, my typical morning uh, ritual, my, you know, meditation, and you know, body movement, stuff like that. Uh, I was like, okay, I really want to get focused and dialed in because I want to, I want to bring as much clarity to this topic, which I'm going to talk about today as I can. So I'm like, all right, you know, here's the, here's the bee, all this sort of stuff. So I'm super, super excited about that. Like it's a good sign, take a picture of it and all that sort of stuff. And so I go into my practice and I'm like sitting, I'm meditating and so forth. And um, I feel something on my, on my left hand. And I'm like, I don't know, like 10 minutes into it and I feel something into my left hand. And um, I immediately twitch. You know, obviously I wasn't as deep or as settled as you know i would like to be i guess because i twitch you know you know if i was really really deep into it i probably wouldn't have but nonetheless i twitch you know i'm still a work in progress like we all are and the moment i twitch i uh um i open my eyes because you know i'm thinking like is that the b is that the is that the is that what what is on my on my hand and the moment i open my eyes uh the cat, the feline olive, uh, she was the cause of it. She had brushed up against my hand. She didn't, sometimes she leans into me if I'm in meditation, uh, but this was like much, much more, more uh, subtle. You know, it wasn't that. That's why I thought it may have been a bee. And when I open my eyes, she's about three feet straight up in the air. Like she jumped, like immediately from my twitch, um, she leaped directly up in the air, which is very much unlike her. You know, that's not her typical, um, you know, she's not a skittish cat that way. And I just kind of, the whole thing made me laugh. It brought me, <laughs> kind of broke my concentration to see her like that. But I also thought it was interesting because uh, I didn't move that much, but her response was so extreme that it was definitely an indication of, you know, these connections we have uh, with, with, you know, particularly with the cat world, you know, cats are very sensitive in seeing how she jumps. So I thought that was kind of a, uh, that was, that was the, um, that was the, the point of reference, which 
I'm bringing into this talk today, this talk today. And so the nature of this talk is more of a response. It's a response to a video which was put out by my friend Howdy Mikowski. And if you've watched the the real trilateral commission, that, that howdy. And I think that we have a decent overlap in terms of, you know, people who watch these videos and they watch his videos. I think they're very complimentary. And, you know, I think it's helpful for all of us to, to look to, to hear as many different perspectives as possible so that, you know, we can, we can, we can come up with our own. Um, and so when I say response, maybe that's not the right word because this isn't too howdy. Um, this is this is more so to the audience, and and maybe it's not even that. You know, it's probably more so for me. Uh, after watching his video, he did two videos. I think they came out like maybe about two weeks ago. It was called Spiritual Warfare Number Five, and then he had a he had a response video to that. And um, the reason why he had a response video is because there was so much, there was so much interaction. You know, we, we measure that by, we, we can measure that by the number of comments. Like it, it was commented in, uh, on that video in a greater numbers than, than I guess typical video, uh, of his typical videos. And so that engagement is an indication of like, it resonated, you know, people, people responded to it. And it resonated with me too, or like in terms of like, I felt a need to become involved in, in the conversation. And so <clears throat> that's what, that's, that's what this is. And so for the past, I don't know, week, it's been about a week since I saw that. And it has been heavy in my mind. And, and I don't mean heavy like, like uh, melancholy or emotionally heavy, but heavy meaning like I couldn't move off it. Uh, I would put my awareness or my attention on something else which I'm working on, but I always kept coming back, coming back to this topic, coming back to this topic. I could not move off it. You know, that ha things come into my awareness, probably as they come into your awareness and you think about it for a little bit and then you go on to the next thing. But there's certain things, there's certain things that, you know, you go on to the next thing, but then you come back to it, you come back to it. And that's what I mean by heaviness. And this is, this is, um, this is, uh, uh, my reflection, I think that's a better way of describing it. This is my reflection to, to what Howdy shared. And in, in no ways is this like a, a um, you know, like a, um, like a, a combative, a combative uh, response or a combative reflection saying like, you know, no, there's this way or that way. Uh, it's a little bit different than that. It brought something up out of me. And so if you haven't seen the video, I, I definitely recommend you go watch it just for the fact of, you know, it's very, very thought provoking. And, and that is what I think, I mean, that's what I've, my motivation, I suppose, for making these videos. And I'm assuming it's the same with Howdy is, is, is to, to inspire new ways of seeing things as we're all kind of in the same boat understanding the, uh, you know, this experience which we're having. So the, the nature of the video, of Howdy's video, began with, um, it began with, with the, the mummies on parade, and that was what we talked about in the trilateral episode, I think it was number two, which we did, which came out last week, and that was a lot of fun, and at the time of that video, when we recorded it, Howdy had already put out this spiritual warfare video, um, but I had not seen it. He made reference to it in our conversation prior to recording, and so that, in, that intrigued me. It piqued my interest, so I went and I watched it. And what, so he talked about the, the, the 
the the mummies on parade and that being an indication of of things to come and and he he told his story he's like you know this is how i see things and this is what 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 this means to me and he's he's very very clear in his video and particularly in the second video he's like i'm not telling anyone to think this way i'm just telling you this is how i think um and so so this is this is in reflection of hearing his thoughts and what it brought up out of me. And a big part of his video dealt with, you know, what is seemingly to come, what's seemingly going to be unfolding, the next part of this, this, this journey which is being thrusted upon the people on earth uh, beginning last march and so that's where that's where i want to um that's where i want to begin with this conversation with this with with my reflections i want to i i, I want to go back to basics i want to talk about the human experience what it means to be human in context of what is happening right now and in order to do that and when i say the human experience like i don't mean like you know uh we are um you know we are we're we're, we're spiritual beings having a a, a physical experience or, or looking at things from from uh you know we're souls we're eternal souls having an experience i'm not i'm not talking about that i'm talking like more basic i'm talking about like being a human being and being alive uh on earth and and that's why i want to begin i want to begin with basics and really go over some fundamentals because what's going to happen and and i'm in agreement with with howdy and you know it shouldn't be any surprise to anyone that things are changing you know the way which we used to live life or experience life on earth is you know it has changed and it's going to continue to change and it probably ain't going to be too comfortable uh in a certain way in a certain way you know it it, it depends upon how we look at it or how we approach it and so what that means is we're going to as individuals we're going to have to go through adjustments you know we're going to have to adjust we're going to have to adjust and when you know let's let, i'm going to use the the analogy of posture like if you want to go and work on on your posture if you're aware of, of of posture and you know its significance to the physical form uh in every way like just you know from how you move to like how you feel in your body and all sorts of different things like that and you know posture becomes something which which is important to you you know you don't go and address your back or your shoulders or anything like that that's not where posture begins posture begins literally where your feet meet the ground not with shoes because shoes are what <laughs> what destroys posture um but your feet on the ground and you begin by adjusting your feet you know creating a equal an equal balance on on the outer perimeters of your feet and when you do that and you get your feet um uh balanced in terms of how they're meeting the ground you know not rolling into your soles of your feet or you know rolling too far out you know each person has a different way i suppose of their nat of what feels natural their, their, their default position with their feet. Uh, when you begin to adjust that and get it to um, a more balanced position, there's a chain reaction of events. And so like when you adjust your feet uh, to the correct way, um, it's gonna affect your ankles and your ankles are gonna adjust a little bit. And when your ankles adjust a little bit, your knees are gonna adjust a little bit. And when your knees adjust a little bit, your hips adjust a little bit. And then finding posture in your back with your spine becomes much much easier as opposed to if you know you want to adjust your posture and you go right to your spine and it feels uncomfortable and it doesn't feel it feels like you're working you're working too hard with your muscles with your muscles of your back or your shoulder uh you know 
compared to that, when you work with your feet, it becomes much more natural. And so this is why, why understanding the foundation is, is so important. When we go back to the foundation, when we go back to understanding foundations, then other parts that are built upon it, then they, their, their adjustments become almost effortless or they become more natural. So we're going to talk about that with the human experience. So this is the foundation. This is, this, is, this is where it all begins. It all begins with this. You have a human body. You have a human body. And there is a link to, to your consciousness, to, to your awareness, to your thinking mind, whatever we want to call it. And we'll talk about the link in a moment. But you have this physical body, and there is ground beneath your feet, and there is sky over your head. Like just those, those three things. That is the beginning. That is the foundation of the human experience. That is, you know, in the, in the posture metaphor, that is where the feet meets the ground. Everything else comes after that. And it's a standard deviation of this. So we return to this as we begin to reassess the situation. Everything that comes after that is, is, is adds to the story which we have of being, being a human being. So the, another part, so we're going to go and we're going to look at a, a whole bunch of different kind of like fundamentals. So um, we have this human body. And our human body is linked to our consciousness or our awareness. And, you know, what I mean by that is like, you know, you, you just think and you, I can raise my hand by like commanding my body. I can move my body just by, by, by thinking. And usually when we're moving our body, it is not a conscious thought. It's, it's, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that. But we can be conscious with it. And the more, um, the more we understand and practice this relationship between the body and the mind, we're, we're, deeping all of it. we're deepening, we're strengthening these, this, this link, this link. Um, or we know our body and our mind are, are, are also linked because we feel, we feel um, the sensations on the physical body, both like those that are pleasurable and those that are not. Um, you know, that's an indication of the linkage. But the linkage is mysterious. You know, we, we can understand aspects of it, but, you know, at least for me, like I don't fully understand it. I just recognize that it exists. And what I mean by that is we can also disconnect. We can also disconnect our consciousness from our body. And so examples of this could be like when you're asleep. When you're asleep, you know, you, your, your body can be moved. Things can happen and, you know, you're not really aware of it. You know, you're not feeling it. You know, your, your consciousness is, is somewhere else. More extreme would be if you're literally unconscious, if you're knocked unconscious, like you have even less of a connection with your physical body. Um, if you're put underneath uh, anesthesia, you know, they can literally like cut you open and pull out your guts and you don't feel it. You don't feel it. Um, when you're in shock, if you go into shock, if you go into psychological shock, there is a disconnect between your consciousness and the body and, and even the outer world. Uh, this is also something which, which can be a skill, like that can be purposefully done. You know, when we, when we journey, when we, do, when we do specific journeys, we are disconnecting from our body and we're going somewhere else, you know. Supposed uh, remote viewers, Remote viewers, when you're remote viewing, you are taking your consciousness outside of your body and you're putting it somewhere else. Um, what we'll call psychedelic, uh, psychedelic substances, you know, those are other ways in which we are able to, to disconnect from our, from our 
disconnect the connection between our consciousness and our physical body. So the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that, that there is a, a mysterious, maybe not fully understood, but relationship which we have between our consciousness and our physical body. And they're linked, but they can be separated, sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously, or, or with purpose or, or without purpose. Conscious has, has multiple connotations. And so when I'm using the same word with different connotations, you know, that can be confusing. So I'll try not to do that. So, okay, so that's another, that's another basic. Understanding, just understanding that's part of the human experience, part of being a human being in a human body. <clears throat> so, so there is this, this thing which we're going to call the inner world. And so you have an inner world, and that's more or less describes your relationship between your consciousness and your physical body. That really, that that link, that that looking at that as a totality, and your inner world consists of of your thoughts, your ideas, um, your emotions, your feelings, physical sensations, um, uh, drives, you know, uh, reactions instincts, all of that sort of stuff. That, that makes up your, your inner world. And then there's an outer world. And that outer world is everything else. It's everyone else's inner world. It's life itself. It's the weather. It's like everything that is not part of your inner world. And in the same way that there is this kind of nebulous, uh, uh, mysterious relationship between your consciousness and your physical body there is also a strange mysterious relationship between the inner world and the outer world and they have kind of a a give take um, relationship and sometimes one leads the other and sometimes the other leads the other and so the outer world has a, an interesting way of giving us, giving you, giving me, giving all of us people, um, giving us what we expect. The outer world gives us what we expect. Now, expect is not necessarily the same as what we want, but expect is much, much, much deeper. It's almost, it's, it's, you know, this would be unconscious. We're not even aware of what we expect. Um, our expectations are, and how they're formed and developed are, um, are, are part of the mystery of consciousness, you know, understanding how that works and how that's influenced. So, so the outer world seemingly gives us what we expect. And it's not always like in this one-to-one -one relationship. And, and, and sometimes like what we want, you know, lines up with what we expect. And, you know, it's, it's, it's complex, you know, it's just not that simple. Um, you know, the old adage, like, you know, you're always going to get what you need, not what you want, you know. Uh, that kind of is, I'm, I'm flirting with that area of thought. But... The relationship goes both ways because the outer world will influence what you expect, particularly if you allow it. And so there's this feedback loop. There's this feedback loop, and it can go both ways. And it's always kind of in. Um, it's always it's always in. Um, you know, some sort of uh, dance going back and forth, going back and forth. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not my job. It's not my job to tell anyone, like, you know, what the purpose of life is. But what, what seemingly makes sense to me, you know, going back to these basics, um, you know, the purpose of life is, is, is self-mastery because that's the only thing which you actually have full control of. And so self-mastery can be expressed in infinite different ways, you know, whether that's physically or like emotionally or your reactions or like how your mind works or, how, or where you put your mind in concentration, all that sort of stuff. Like, you know, that's the only thing which you can control. The only thing which you know for certain is that you got a body, you got an inner world and, and you can't 
can't really control the outer world, you can, but you can control your inner world with, with appropriate discipline. And so all of that is, gonna, is, is, being, is, is being activated right now or, or, or being challenged or being tested right now because the outer world is changing. The outer world is changing without a doubt. So um, the inner world and the outer world, they connect through stories. Stories are how they connect. And stories are very, very, very important to the human being and the human experience. And everything's a friggin' story. Anything that has meaning, anything that has interpretation is a story. And there's some stories we're like more aware of that we're holding, and there are a lot of stories. The most, the most significant stories, the stories which create our expectations are the most significant ones. And so again, you know, we're going back to the foundation. We're going back to where the feet meets the ground. We're looking at we're looking at the human experience and if we're looking at, you know, how we meet the outer world, we need to go back to this foundation. We're going to go back to stories, but if we're going to go and look at stories, we're going to have to understand the nature of stories. It is certainly possible, it is certainly possible to strive to have a life without any stories. You know, that is a practice which, which is certainly, you know, it's valuable. Um, it's not exactly true because when you try to go and live a life and eradicate stories, you may eradicate a lot of stories, but, but you know, saying there's no stories is a story. Like, you know, that is part of the human experience. You can't get out of that. It's like, you know, you can't get out of having a body. That's, you know, that's, it's, it's what comes with the experience. So let's look at stories. And this is coming from a dude who like, who is, who loves stories, you know, who has studied stories, who, who, is, who is fascinated with how stories work. So this is the truth. This is the fundamental truth. Every story deconstructs. Every story deconstructs. That is the foundation of stories. And so if you go and you put that in context with like, well, okay, with if my outer, if my inner world meets the outer world and where that dynamic takes place is through my stories. And if every story can deconstruct, you know, what are those implications? What are those implications? So let me go back to the, um, the, uh, the, the deconstruction, what I mean by that. So the most obvious deconstruction is like a story is just factually wrong. It is just a friggin' lie. And, you know, you, if, if you see, if you, if you like this, this channel, if you like, you know, this, the way I approach, you're probably very familiar with the idea or the, 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 the quote, which has been said that if you tell a lie big enough and you tell a lie often enough, it becomes a truth. And so that, that's like the, the first deconstruction of a story. Like we go and see like stories have no, don't necessarily have any, they, in order to, to affect reality, a story does not have to necessarily have any, any, um, any basis in being factual, but there are techniques in which that story can be absorbed within people's inner world and then the outer world reflects it and it becomes true and you get that feedback loop. And I would say that is what we are seeing so obviously in the outer world right now, particularly with the, the, the masses of people. So the first level or the first way which a story can deconstruct is the fact that it ain't even true. It ain't even true. So, so that's a way a story can deconstruct. And then you could have a story which is like kind of partially true, 
but it's built upon what's known as logical fallacies. You know, it's, it's, it's like, you know, there's some truth in it, and then there's kind of like a jump, which isn't exactly the right jump which you would make, but like that logic, that linear thought um, is, is flawed, and when you go and you see these logical fallacies, well, then you can deconstruct that story, you know. Uh, this is a lot of propaganda. Um, the difference between like the big lie and propaganda, there's an overlap, but, but, but like propaganda can be more subtle because it could be based upon a truth. It could be based upon something which is factually accurate. But then the way it is presented and thought about and how it becomes a story is like, you know, it's, there's a logical fallacy. And so a lot of the trivium and quadrivium and, and, and the propaganda reports and, and, and deconstructing the propaganda is, is, is very good with, um, is very important in terms of like understanding what's happening, like on a more uh, uh, surface level of experiencing life and that's 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 significant and so so logical fallacies are a way which stories um, can deconstruct but what about stories which maybe don't have logical fallacies and which aren't like total lies every one of those stories can deconstruct as well that's true but they construct in a in a de in a different way and they can they deconstruct in point of view. The very nature of any story, of every story, is that it can only be told, like when you're telling it, you're telling it from one perspective. And when you are describing an event, it can always be told in infinite different ways. You know, the old adage, like the history is written by the victors, like that points to it. It's like, okay, well then, you know, well, what's the history written by the, by, by the losers? And that's going to be slightly different, but they're telling the same story. Every story can be looked at and interpreted and pulled out with meaning in different ways. And so this does not mean, this does not mean, this does not mean that stories are <clears throat> to be to be avoided what what this means is that we recognize that stories and everything's a story can be broken down and deconstructed as long as you're a human being you're going to have stories you're going to have stories in your mind and they can be done and they can be deconstructed and then rebuilt in different ways and so what that means is what that means is that as we must adjust, as we adjust, we can change our stories. And as we change our stories, we change our inner world. And as we change our inner world, the outer world changes too. Not necessarily, as I'm saying, like in a one-to-one -one way. But it is in a mysterious way. So let me give some examples of... of of like how of 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 stories and inner world and 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 like real real impacts and you know I'm gonna give stories I'm gonna I, you know this is one of the when you begin to get into the the mindset of like I'm gonna deconstruct stories like it is a slippery slope it is a very slippery slope it's it's the same thing with like you know when you get into conspiracy it's like that's a slippery slope you know everything becomes a conspiracy. And and it can be it can be overwhelming and it can it can affect your 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 general emotional uh, well being and so we want to be we want to be we want to recognize you know the nature of things um, we want to recognize that stories deconstruct but then when you start saying like well all the stories deconstruct well then you're just and you go around and you deconstruct all of your stories or everyone else's stories well um, you know that's I wouldn't recommend that as 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 a as a as a um, a lasting strategy. You know, people's stories are are very very personal. It's it's you don't want to go around messing with people's stories. I mean, it's like <laughs> it's like telling someone how to masturbate. It ain't your business. You know, if they ask you, you know, maybe that's something else. But it's like you know, that's for each person. That's their own personal journey. Like let them go and and, and do that. Um, so I, I want to give some example of, of, of stories, you know, and again, these stories can deconstruct, but they're going to illustrate a point. So um, 
you know, back in the 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 the, the Crusades, you know, the the the, the medieval battles between the Moors and the and the Christians. Um, there was a particularly um, there was a particularly uh, feared and fierce group of Islamic warriors. And I can't think of their actual name right now, but it's usually accredited to, or, or the word, the word assassin is 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 said to be a derivative of their name, as is um, the word hashish. And so, how the the story behind behind this 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 group of of amazingly effective warriors is the fact that the leader of this of this group um, when he had identified a recruit or a series of recruits he would invite them to his to his home to his home and he would give them a meal and and he would more or less um, he would he would tell them he's like listen you know I want you to to join our elite order I want you to join our elite order and I want you uh, uh, and I want you to come and you will fight with us and you will fight the 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 good fight you know this is the good fight and so unbeknownst to these recruits is that the food which they they were eating uh, was was laced it was laced with a a powerful but short acting um, sedative and then also a powerful hallucinogenic so they'd eat their food and everyone would like fall asleep and and when they were asleep their bodies were moved to another part of the of the estate and this estate and this part was you know not seen or not known by by these recruits and um and it was you know it was, it was set up to be beautiful and there were like beautiful women all around and when these recruits would wake up when they would wake up uh in a um highly uh intoxicated state um they would be visited by someone who was claiming to be a messenger a messenger of god saying that they have been selected they've been selected to join this elite group and if they're going to join this elite group, they need to fight with with total ferocity and courage, but not to worry for they have, they have within them, they have the 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 one hundred percent support of God, and God will give them the strength and courage to do things which ordinary men cannot do. And at the conclusion of their physical life, they would be in this beautiful place with these beautiful women, and you know they would they would be they would be rewarded for what they would um, for all of their actions. And then there, another sedative was given, and, and each of the recruits, they went back to sleep, and their bodies were brought back to where they had their meal, and eventually they woke up. And so they're waking up, and they're all, you know, a little bit discombobulated, you know, from the entire event, and they start talking, like, oh my God, like, you know, I was visited by, I was visited by, by a messenger, a messenger of God, and he told me to join this group, and he said all of this sort of stuff. And, and the other recruits were like, that happened to me too. And then sure enough, these people became, these men became unbelievably effective warriors. Now again, this is at least a story. Maybe none of this is even true. That's what I'm saying. Like, you know, this illustrates a point. Um, but what happened was a, a story was given to their inner world on a very, very deep level. And then their actual experience in the outer world changed. You know, this is very, very similar to, you know, how MK Ultra is said to occur, like, you know, with all of this, like, deep programming and, and working on these deep, deep levels of, of, of stories within one's mind, and then, and then um, their outer experience, their, their outer capabilities change. So I'll also, um, I'll give, um, I'll give another, I'll give another uh, story, which I think is complimentary. Again, you know, who knows if this, this is real, but you know, it's real enough. The fact that I read about it and, you know, it's part of the, it's part of the mythos of being human. So this one's about Vikings. 
And so the Vikings uh, were also a, a very um, fierce warrior people, and, and they were said to be, um, you know, the finest warriors, and, you know, no one, could, no one could really defeat them because of their, you know, their prowess on the battlefield. And within, within the, 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 the category of Viking, there was like, you know, there were special Vikings, like special super warriors who were even more ferocious and courageous and, 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 and effective on the battlefield. And they were known as berserkers. You know, they're, they're a berserker. That's where, you know, we get that, that, that term from. And to become a berserker... You know what? You know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be like eighty percent accurate with this story. Like it's the gist of it. Like if you're an expert on berserkers, or if you're an expert of the of the story I told of the 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 foundation of the assassins, you know, um, I, I'm in the right ballpark. You know, some of the details are slightly off, but that's not what we're going for right now. We're going for with like understanding an idea. So the berserkers, like what would happen is they were like a normal Viking, and at some point they would um, disengage from the community, and they would spend some time living in the wilderness completely on their own. You know, this could be like a year, maybe like three years, five years, who knows? And during that time, uh, and this is just like kind of like normal, normal, um, a normal occurrence, which is what would happen to any human being if you are completely isolated from other human beings for a considerable amount of time, like all of your stories, all of your understanding of yourself, that's going to deconstruct and it's going to rebuild in a new way. And because there were Vikings and because they were like really, you know, tied into the natural world and, 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 and the animal world at that time and survival and, and all that sort of stuff, these, these berserkers will come back with this animalistic um, part of themselves awaken. And so when they come and they learn something of themselves, they learn something very, very true about themselves, they've experienced it, and they come back into the Viking fold. They are like, you know, they're these berserkers. Like suddenly they are different than all of the other Vikings. Any amount of like Fear, like fear doesn't even exist. In the same way with these assassin guys, fear doesn't exist anymore. They're able to continue to fight. And they got like an arm chopped off. Like that doesn't stop them. Like they don't even flinch. They just keep going and they keep going. And so what happens is their inner world changed. In both of these experiences, their inner world changed. One may be a little bit more manipulative than the other, but at the, the result is seemingly the same. And so the reason I share this story is just like to give examples like, you know, we are at a time right now. Uh, it's changing. I'm in I'm in I'm in total agreement with 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 howdy's um interpretation of like you know things are going to get uh things are probably going to get more and more um difficult for people who do not want to go along with the um to go along with the the uh you know the the mainstream narrative and um and so we're going to find ourselves in that place and be and that is going to happen on a baseline human being living on earth sort of perspective and so we need to make adjustments and 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 this is the time where our inner world needs to change and we understand um we understand that if if you break down and you look at this this human experience and how we work like stories are very very important the interpretation of stories is very very important and all of them all of them can be broken down now it has to be broken down and rebuilt in a way which is as which is experientially true for the most part. You can't like you can't bullshit yourself. But that being said, we're looking at the model. We're going back. And so so the one thing I want to say at this point is like, you know, it's it's choose your own adventure time and choose your stories wisely. Choose your stories in a way which empowers you. Or at least that would be that would be my suggestion. You know, I shared with you 
I shared with you my story on another video. I shared with you my story, and that story can be deconstructed as well as it relates to escaping the matrix and the, and the, the significance and the correspondence of flowing water. Now, the reason why that story makes sense to me is because you break everything down and you go and say, like, all of the other stories, all of these other stories, which may be accurate, they may be less accurate, who knows? There is always going to be a part of belief. Every story which we incorporate in our inner worlds will ultimately come to a point of belief. And they tell us, they tell us in the word, belief is be the lie. And what that means is all of the stories can be deconstructed. None of them are 100% objectively true in every single scenario. That is not a problem with stories. That is the nature of stories. And so the, my story is like I'm going to go to as real of a as real of a, a a beginning in which I can. And for me, that is what I call baseline reality. I think there's a whole lot more than baseline reality. I don't quite know what that is. That's the greater reality. That's the mystery. I can, I, you know, I'm just speaking for myself. I can, I can walk that walk. I'm happy and I'm comfortable with the fact that I don't know. I don't understand the mystery of life, but I understand it to this level. And so this is how I'm going to go work with it. If you choose to follow another story, like anything else which is an explanation in terms of navigating this, which is, you know, maybe coming from a holy text, uh, any, even if it resonates with you deeply, you know, choose that wisely. Those stories, every single one of those, 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 those holy texts, each one of them. You know, I think they all contain truths. I think they all contain things which we can extract from them, but I think they all can be deconstructed. So, you know, those are, those are, uh, um, those are my two cents as it relates, as it relates to that. So now I want to get, um, I want to talk a little bit more practical, I suppose, for, for the remainder of, of, of the free section. Um, something which, which I find interesting and I find helpful, particularly in context of like, okay, well, you know, <laughs> you know, what I do with that, Mike, you know, <laughs> it's interesting information, but you know, well, what do you suppose I do? What do I suppose I do when all of these things start changing? You know, when, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm forced with like, well, I can't do this unless, unless I do that, unless I play by their ball game and I don't want to play by their ball game or by their rules. Um, well, the first thing I want to say is, you got to remember, you got to remember this, you got to remember this. Um, the world which we're living in, the culture, um, all of like the goodies, how it works, the monetary system, like, you know, all of that, which is uh, access to public transportation, access to private transportation, all that sort of stuff. Um, it ain't yours. It ain't mine. It's theirs. They created it. We didn't create it. We were born into it. And so we've become ingrained to it. It became part of our story because that's how the human being works. What you were born into, you know, it becomes your second nature. Like, you know, it is not the nature of Mike to speak English. That is not my nature, but it became my second nature because I grew up in a household where they spoke, where they spoke English. So it is very, very personal in this experience to me but it ain't it ain't the, the 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 primary truth and so the same is true with with this system and so what's happening and so what the what the um what the 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 punishment of not doing what you're told is is the fact that they're going to kick you out of the system they're going to excommunicate you and because you've been ingrained in it, you know, you're like, I don't want that to happen. And, and understandably, like, you know, I get that. You know, I still want to have access to the things which, which, um, which I've grown accustomed to, let's say. Um, but it ain't mine, you know. And if we get evicted, and we most likely will get evicted one way or the other, you know, either in, in, in like a one swoop or maybe in like 
pieces, you know, my senses will probably be in, in piecemeal. There's going to be a time in which we can walk both worlds, but we should walk in both worlds with awareness, with the expectation of like, you know what? Um, I don't want to be in this world because this world, the system, the system and all of the parts of the system, they are an inversion. They may feel natural because we're part of it, but they are inherently an inversion. We're being evicted from an apartment which has black mold in it. You know, there's part of you which is like, I don't want to be evicted. That's a pain in my friggin' ass. But you know what? You don't want to be living in that black mold apartment anyway. So it's probably for your best. It's your best interest. So again, like, you know, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? We begin to recognize uh, the only thing we can do is our own, is, is, is our self-mastery, which is understanding our inner world and, and remaining true to that, understanding our principles, all of this sort of stuff. Like, that's really the only thing you can, you can do. And then, when the world meets you when the outer world meets you you have developed you have developed the 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 inner strength to whatever degree it is you know we're all like you know we're all working on it. this is what practice is practice is the road to mastery you never arrive at mastery but we're always practicing our practice is this so so that as the outer world changes our inner world is is more um integrated and our stories serve us you know, and that's going to be a personal friggin' journey. You know, another person is not going to give you your story. What we can do, what we all do, what we all do for each other is we share pieces of our own stories, and then you know we 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 take what makes sense, and and you know we we let the we let the other stuff go. You know, and and, and we find our way in this in this really 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 special interesting time. So at this point, I'm gonna I'm gonna um, I'm gonna reference this book. All right. It's called The Principles of Effortless Power. It's by Peter Ralston. And I'm about in 56 minutes into this. I'll probably go another 10 minutes before I go into the second part of, of this video. Um, so Peter, this book came into my awareness in the, the autumn of 2012. Uh, in that time, this like really, really mysterious dude just shows up in my life. Um, at the time, I was practicing Aikido, and he came through the Aikido dojo. He was like a journeyman, he was, like literally, like that was his life. He was a journeyman, and um, he was a a very um, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it high ranking, like in terms of, of the, the, his Aikido rank, um, a fifth Don, Dan, a fifth Dan, I think that's how it's pronounced, D-A-N, I don't know if it's pronounced Dan or Don, but that's pretty high level, and he was very experienced, and he came through, and so he, he was at, he, he came in about like October 2012, and in a small little dojo in Lancaster, PA, and, um, he and I struck up uh, uh, an accord, and he, he offered, he was like, hey, Mike, you want to go and, and do some, um, you know, private training with me? And, and so for three months, from like October through January, like right over that real interesting time of 2012, we worked. And it was, we worked together, and he showed me like all sorts of what would be known as the inner arts. And one of the things which he suggested is that I, I become familiar with this book. And so, what is it? It's 20, it's, it's nine years later. Um, and, um, you know, I've read the book, parts of the book, numerous times over the past 10 years. The book is um, mysterious <laughs> as can be. But even though the fact that I'm reading it, I don't have any idea what I'm reading, you know, I kept reading. And I will say this, over the past 10 years, my relationship with my body, how I move my body, how my body, um, my, my, my um, control over my body has changed drastically. And, and I, I owe a lot to that three month period, which I studied um, with this mysterious person, and then also continuing to go back to this book. So I'm gonna read a little bit about the book. But I'm gonna begin with this. I'm gonna read the back. It's written by Peter Ralston, so you know where this is coming from. This is a martial arts book, but it's not. It's much, much deeper than that. And so and when I read about this, when I'm gonna pull some parts from it, uh, 
the context which most people who read this, or I mean, I'm making that assumption, you know, which I'm assuming that most people are going to take it is like, this has a martial arts connotation. But I'm going to suggest that it has a connotation which is about meeting reality. And that has always been true, but it's more true now than ever before. So let me tell you who this dude is. Peter Ralston. Peter Ralston was raised in Asia and began studying martial arts at the age of nine. By the age of 19, he was a black belt in judo and jiu-jitsu, black belt in karate, had been sumo champion in his high school in Japan, judo and fencing champion at University of California at Berkeley, and had demonstrated proficiency in Kempo, Chuan Fa, and Northern Sil Lum Kung Fu. Later, he studied Tai Chi Chuan, Sing Ai Chuan. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing these right. I'm doing my best. <laughs> Pao Kuo Chong, Aikido, Japanese and Chinese fencing, and Western boxing. Consistent with his Zen studies, his investigation in martial arts came to include a questioning of reality. In 1975, Ralston founded the Chengxing School of Internal Martial Arts and Center for Ontological Research, which operated for 20 years in Oakland, California. In 1978, he became the first non-Asian ever to win the World Championship Full Contact Martial Arts Tournament held in the Republic of China. He currently teaches workshops and training seminars all over the world. So I share that with you to kind of give you like a context of like where this guy's coming from. So I'm going to go to the towards the back of the book. The book is is it's it's very it's it's you never you don't know what you're reading. If you've ever read any like esoteric works and you're reading it, you're like, what the hell am I reading? Like this is the same thing, but this is very much grounded in the in working the physical body, but it's also grounded in the fact that the physical body is something much much more than that, and it deals with the very nature of reality. So. Um, Finding the, uh, the, this chapter is called The Principle of Effective Interaction, a summary. Finding the principle, there is reason that certain people and methods are effective while others are not. Since most of us believe that skill is founded on genetics or training, knowledge or even luck, it is perhaps difficult to believe and even more difficult to grasp that skillful interaction is based on a principle. So skillful interaction, that means in the most basic level, the inner world interacting with the outer world. That's what all of this is about. And martial arts is just a, an extreme example of what's always going on. So skillful interaction is based on a principle. If this is so, however, what is the principle? What governs our perception, thinking, intent, impulse, feeling, and movement determining our success or failure in an interaction? So I'm reading this in context of the interaction which we're all having right now with the outer world. Founded on the most basic components that make up interaction, the qualities of the principle of effective interaction are so fundamental that it is easy to overlook them. So the most important things are so basic that you don't even think it's a thing. Our degree of interactive ability, so how well you're going to interact with life, however, is determined by our level of adherence to this principle. He's yet to define the principle, but he keeps talking about the principle. And so we would be wise to make an effort to truly grasp it. Like, let's go and start looking at the principle. I've attempted to disclose the nature of the principle in a single sentence. But please remember, while a sentence may be revealing, it cannot provide an understanding or an experience of the principle. One phrase that communicates the principle of effective interaction. So this is like the whole book comes down to this one sentence. I'm going to tell you right now, the sentence is like, what? That's the sentence? But yeah, we're, 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 we're getting into this. So, 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 so free your mind. So here is the sentence. Our actions must be appropriately commensurate with the occurring event. Entire book is about that. 
So what we do, how we meet the outer world must be in total proportion appropriately with what is happening. So in the context, in the context of what's going on in the world, what this says to me, what this says to me is how we respond to it must be equal to it. And so in one light, particularly if you're going to hold the idea that if you're being kicked out of a system, that you want to fight to protect that system or to keep your, your um, connection to that system. You know, that's one way of looking at that. But the way I see it, possibly you will as well, is that system was never yours. It was never mine. This is not ours to defend. If anything, that is what this is about, to get you to fight that system. So how do you meet it? The more you, they kick you out, you leave it with equal amounts. That is, how you, that is how you meet it. Now, this is where the adventure begins. We don't know where we're going. Here's another fundamental truth of the human experience. It is a friggin' mystery in all aspects. We're being asked to go into the wilderness. What the wilderness looks like, I don't know. In this, in this analogy, the wilderness is outside of the system. Let me return to the book. What does this mean? The, the sentence he just said. In short, that everything we must do, in short, that everything we do must conform to whatever action, condition, condition or circumstance arises and must be appropriate for realizing our objectives. Put this in context to the changing of reality. So whatever is going to happen, whatever is going to be unfolding, we must be able to meet that and we need to meet that appropriately. But we also have to recognize what our objective is. That's a personal choice. What are your objectives? Is your objective to stay in the system? Is your objective to find a midpoint? Is your objective to leave the system? That is an individual choice. This may sound simple, yet there is much that doesn't at first meet the eye. Another statement pointing to this principle, the principle of meeting life, meeting the occurring, the occurring event with appropriate action, is this. This is another statement. Our actions must be designed by the present relationship as it is occurring, so that our purpose for interaction is realizing. Got to stay present. We can't get into these stories about what may or may not happen. What is actually happening? What are we seeing in our actual lives? And meet that. All right, let me go through a couple other um, sections. Um, our perceptions are only grasped through a process of interpretation. And this process depends on many contributing factors that can be wrong and about what we think is actually there. So this is a statement about stories. He's like, you are going to interpret events, you're going to interpret it in, in a story form. And guess what? That story form in many, many cases is not going to serve you. You're going to miss things. You're going to be looking at it the wrong way. So we talked a little bit about stories before. Um, Keeping our full attention on everything that is immediately occurring can be quite difficult. You know, that's going to be life and what we're seeing. This is where our ability to feel becomes so important. The vast amounts of information flying at us in every moment, we must create a new sense perception that can relate to the data immediately as, a whole, as one whole. So he's saying, like, you got to develop a new perception, a sensing perception. It has to be developed and it has to be new. This is not some dude who's like just like coming up with theories, talking concepts. This is a dude who battled in like the 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 uh, the the. the 
the the back in private china in the private chinese full contact martial arts this man is is speaking from experience martial arts is a extreme example of meeting reality so when he's talking about this he's not talking about this as a concept he's talking about this as someone who has experienced it what we need is a sophisticated feeling sense that provides an awareness of every aspect of the constantly changing relationship. So, you know, this dance between the inner world and the outer world. You need to develop this new sophisticated feeling sense that meets the world in every aspect of this constantly changing dynamic. One that can deliver all of this information in a form that is useful and yet easy to access, enabling us to respond swiftly to what is happening. So think about this. Life is going to change. You're going to be asked to go to places which you don't know. You can't prepare for it. You can't prepare for it. So you need to develop a sense which meets everything as it is. And it's something that's got to be easy. In matters that require psychophysical interaction, that's life, we do well to move our perceptions away from the intellectual decision-making function and towards a feeling sense that, in, that includes what is occurring. Get out of your mind. Get out of your stories. We're going to have stories. We're going to need a story to set, the fa to set the stage. But then we have to react in a way which is not necessarily coming from this mental decision-making process. As well as what needs to be done about it. So this is how we meet, this is how we meet the changing occurrences with this, this new, this, uh, this new psychophysical um, uh, uh, skill set. This con conscious sensation should perceive any and all activity as it happens. This is in real time, in the now. Accept, assess our relationship with what is occurring and discern every distinction we need in order to make sound choices for interaction. As life unfolds, we develop the skill set so that we know how to respond to it. We don't have to think about it. We're responding to life. In short, our feeling sense, this ability, should include everything that's going on. It must be highly sensitive, but not reactive or emotionally controlled. Not emotionally controlled. So you say to yourself, you're like, well, well, what is that? And so that I think is, well, one, I'm going to say that everything which you have been working with in your entire life is what it is. Like, you know, this is not, if this is not coming to us, uh, this is not coming to us out of the blue. If you're listening to this, you have been doing something, you've been working on something, whatever that is, like that's where it is for you. And what this feeling sense is, there are infinite ways or infinite ways in which this is, which this is, um, which, which this can be, uh, experienced, I suppose. Um, in the second half of this video, I'm going to go into my model. Which isn't this guy's model. This is my model based upon the things which make sense to Mike. It's not to say this is the way to do it, but this is the way which, which works for me and which I do. In fact, what I do up in my meditation, which I made reference to earlier on today. Um, and the reason I share that is to inspire uh, new ideas or maybe confirm what you're already doing within your own practice and also like if you don't even if you don't have a place to begin well maybe this might be a good place for you to begin so I'm gonna read one final section and then I'm gonna end it I'm gonna end it for the free portion first we need to realize that no principle or dynamic stands alone they are each part of a whole and complex matter so we're breaking all of these things up into pieces, but we know it's all connected. You know, we talked about the inner world and the outer world. We talked about the mind and the body and all of those sort of things. And I looked at it or described it as separate pieces, but we know they're all connected. The principles all work together to, uh, you must have a system where the principles all work together to enhance and encourage one another. Understanding their interrelated nature can help us overcome barriers to realizing any one of these principles. 
I want to illustrate this by looking at the effect that, that one of these principles, relaxation, one of these principles, relaxation, let's talk about relaxation now, has in relation to one we are working on here regarding skillful interaction. So he's talking about the importance of relaxation in terms of interacting. Now, this is kind of grounded in martial arts fighting, but this is about reacting with the outer world. And it's talking about the importance of being relaxed and poised as the world's getting nuts, right? Relaxation does not in itself accomplish anything except in change, change in the body's condition and consequently, a shift in attitude and disposition. Nevertheless, relaxation quite frequently serves our ability to be effective. So as we're going through all this stuff, the importance of being relaxed, of, and it's going to be hard because stuff is, is, is stressful, but being able to go back to actual physical, mo emotional, psychological rela relaxation is key. Why is this so? Certainly relaxing re loosens the tissue so that we can adapt to changing circumstances with much greater speed and accuracy. Anytime we speak of rela relaxing and interaction, however, it calls for maintaining this, this condition continuously, learning to be able to, 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 to uh, uh, embody a constant state of relaxation. This is not this is not something which you just do. You know, it is a practice. It is something I'm going to practice to it. I was in a deep state of relaxation in my meditation until that cat touched my 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 hand, but obviously there was a part of me which wasn't deep enough because I startled. So we're always in, we're always deepening our practice on our road to mastery. Continuous relaxation must be sustained throughout the interaction or we cannot say we are being relaxed. So we want to be relaxed. It's something we want to move towards. It's, you know, it's an ideal. We don't hold ourselves to any sort of false uh, reality that we're going to be relaxed, but we know we're moving towards it. With relaxation as a base state, our responses to action to life and force are altered as are the methods and strategies we use for taking action or achieving some result. For example, our actions will not be the same as they would if we use tension and strength as a foundation. As the world is changing, as you're being kicked out of a world, as all of these sort of things, if you meet that with tension and if you're going to meet that with strength and fighting it, um, it's not going to be the same as if you meet it with relaxation. Nor will they be the same as they would if solely focused on achieving results we have in mind. So it's like you got to get out of like the long term, like what are you trying to do? But you remain present with what is actually in your face at the given moment. What is in your own backyard? What are you being of? What are you being approached with? Take care not to underestimate the significance of what is kept in mind here. It suggests that our efforts may be sourced from a conceptual realm rather than being a sensitive response to what is actually occurring. Don't get stuck in your stories. Meet the world as it is. It further suggests that our disposition toward an interpretation of the matter is very important and that our habitual reactive inclinations are not necessarily the best ones to have, even if they're the most common. So again, this comes back to our stories, re-examining our stories, rebuilding our stories in a way that we can be reactive and relaxed with what is happening. Now consider again our observation that responding from a state of relaxation will alter our actions. The more relaxed you are, you're going to respond differently. The principle for effective interaction suggests the need to have our actions match the occurring event, but still we wonder how to accomplish this. Focusing on and attempting to produce a desired result isn't going to do this. 
Yet we find in something as elementary as relaxation an inherent quality of adaptability to the occurring event that other approaches, such as the use of strength and tension, don't have. The state of relaxation allows us to meet life in this changing time. We may not immediately accomplish our result through an adherence to relaxation, but we will have taken a big step toward aligning with the principle of effective interaction. So relaxation allows us to meet the changing environment. This principle, such as relaxing, more important. This makes principles such as relaxing more important than we may have previously considered. This simple example illustrates that the disposition demanded by relaxation, especially to maintain it in the face of action and, rela and reaction, requires an attitude of accommodation. What's going to happen is going to happen. Meet it. They're kicking us out of a system. System you shouldn't want to be in anyway. It's a gift, but we meet that with relaxation. We meet it with the degree in which in which it's happening, not in the stories which they're telling us, but what we're seeing. We're aware of what's going on, but we've created our own inner stories and our own inner world in a way that we can meet this with relaxation. Even if relaxation isn't going to get us to where we think we want to go, we know that the relaxation will allow us the physical relaxation, the psychological relaxation, the emotional relaxation, so that we can go and meet whatever's coming and this will move us along our journey. This is why I suggest we align to flowing water. Any disposition we adopt in the face of incoming data not only sets the tone for our response to what is perceived, it designs and determines the kind of actions and strategies we will undertake. So there we go. This is Uncle Mike. This is the end of the, the first part of the video, the free part in part two. I'm going to be going into my own practice, and this is more of, of a, a way of creating of creating a system. In the very beginning of the book, we talked about building a, a, a new perception base. This is my own way, which I've been practicing this for at least seven years, of developing my own system of, develop, of increasing a new perception reality. That's what I'm going to be talking about in the second half. Uh, so the, those of you who are going to watch that video, I'll see you on the other side. For my other friends, I'll see you at the next video. Oh, uh, you know, you can also go and check me out, you know, at Susquehanna Alchemy. Uh, the, the, the video, which the, the premium part, that's at, at subscribe star Susquehanna Alchemy. All that's going to be in the... Um, in the uh, the comments below or the text below. And lastly, I want to show you this. This here is some of my new shirts or my new swag. This is available at the swag shop. This is a um, collage piece I made, which is now on t-shirt form. And this is actually, this is uh, inspired by my experience down in Peru. If you look in this corner right here, that is the, the cabin which I was in during the ayahuasca experiences. You could see like the little bird on the uh on the tree right here you know that's significant and the two beings that are watching it so you know if that stuff excites you if you like the shirt you like it as a print even as a sticker be certain to go to the uh susquehanna alchemy swag shop i'll have a link to that you could also get to that through my um through my my website so thank you for listening uh thank you howdy for inspiring all of this type of this conversation and um though we're each walking our independent journey we are walking it in accordance or in 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 harmony with each other at least those of us that are on this video so take good care and i will see you soon